So, ladies and gentlemen, uh, good afternoon. I would like to start uh, this uh, mini microfinance with a short uh, code of candy. Be the change you want to see in the world. So, my name is uh, Sonia Simoes, um, and I have the honor to warmly welcome you on the name of Bank de Luxembourg to this uh, 55th Midi de la Microfinance. Um, it is a real pleasure for us to host again this uh, event, uh, which is already organized since 2006 by ADA. Uh, it's a really great event. So, uh, over the last 16 years, uh, this event brought about uh, 100 speakers together from all over the world and uh, has already 40 associated uh, partners and sponsors. So for us, it's a really pleasure to be part of this successful event uh, for so many years now. And a special thank you also uh, to uh, you to attend to these uh, discussions and also something, some, some of you who are really loyal to this uh, event over all these years. So uh, as you might know, uh, no Bank de Luxembourg uh, has a long-standing reputation in the social responsibility company in the Luxembourg uh, community and uh, ESG being currently a hot topic, uh, our bank naturally closely monitors a broad spectrum of ESG related regulations uh, to anticipate and monitor integration of environmental, social and governance measures into um, our business models and operator systems. Um, as of uh, 31st December 2021, uh, Bank de Luxembourg was servicing 3.6 billion uh, net assets uh, invested in non-liquid uh, impact strategy funds, uh, out of which uh, 2.6 million are microfinance investments uh, funds. So um, when undertaking um, an initial assessment on the current SFDR classification of our current portfolio of fund clients, uh, representing more than 400 funds and uh, sub-funds, um, it led to a high-level assessment that at least 10% of this portfolio um, is already aligned with uh, Article 8 or 9 of SFDR, and uh, this uh, assessment is ongoing and uh, keeping in mind that the result is a moving target with many of our funds' uh, clients which are uh, aiming to uh, change from Article 6 to Article 8, 9 classification over the next uh, coming years. Um, in our portfolio of microfinance funds, um, we are also servicing two microinsurance funds um, managed by a big well-known asset manager in the market and uh, initiated <coughs> by uh, development banks. Um, as a component of microfinance, microinsurance became a major a product line in Africa and Asia over the last years and even more uh, over the last two years with uh, the COVID pandemic. It has been uh, have an impact in this area also. So a recent study uh, showed that the global microinsurance market reached a value of uh, 78.4 billion in 2021 and expects that the market reach out uh, 111 billion by 2027. Uh, on the other side, uh, over the last decade, various events and initiatives have brought uh, about a deep-seated realization in the investment and financial world that a long-term value creation is not possible without a sustainable development perspective. And this is also the case for insurance industry in Luxembourg and, uh, and worldwide. Um, this is how uh, we came to the, today's topic uh, dedicated to the sustainable insurance, a meeting of two worlds. It's there where I leave uh, the floor to our panel of experts uh, who will explain how the two worlds of insurance and financial professionals can integrate sustainability and ESG criteria into their business models. So, uh, Matthew, the floor is yours uh, and looking forward to this uh, interesting uh, discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Sonia, for that introduction. And welcome to the 55th uh, Midi de la Microfinance. My name is Matthew Gensini. I'm a, 
program coordinator, Ada. I'm also a board member of the Microinsurance Network. And this is the third Midi de la Microfinance that focuses on microinsurance. The first one we did was really to kind of give a, give a flavor of what microinsurance is by giving examples from, I think, the Philippines and, and Pakistan. The second was uh, concentrating with, uh, focused with uh, the Women's World Bank and looking at how the challenges of providing insurance solutions in Africa. And before we go into today's session, I just would like a to raise a hand. Who's an insurance company here? <coughs> Who's from the insurance company here in the crowd? So we've got two up there. Okay, so a little bit. So we might focus on you guys in a, in a little bit. But <laughs> today's uh, event is really kind of, we're moving away from the field and moving more to kind of the global players within the insurance industry. And we're looking at trends that are, that two major trends that are happening in the in insurance industry that are very much intrinsically linked. So the first one is we're seeing the insurance industry move to a more sustainable practices, more, more sustainable investments with the ESG requirements. And then the other trend is we're seeing the big insurance players, the big insurance companies moving towards the developing market. So partnering with uh, partners in the, the developing market to find solutions for um, vulnerable populations, providing insur insurance to vulnerable populations. Now, you're going to hear a lot about insurance, sustainable insurance, ESGs, and if you're anything like me, these are concepts that I've grappled with and tried hard to, to understand properly. But with my panel here today, I'm sure that you, by, by the end of it, you're going to be able to go home to your family, to your colleagues, and be able to explain what sustainable insurance means, why it's important, why ESG is important, and the effect that it's happening on the kind of inclusive insurance uh, market. So for me to do that, we've got a very distinguished panel, a little bit gender imbalanced, I have to say, <laughs> <laughs> but in a good way, in a good way. Uh, um, from the insurance industry, so we've got Catherine Pulvermacher, who's the executive director of the Microinsurance Network. We've got um, uh, uh, Laura Rosado, who is the, I'm just trying to get the, the, the names, uh, Strategy and Performance Manager at AXA Emerging Markets. And then we've got Victoria Ohoronik, who is the Associate Director at AM Best. AM Best is an insurance rating agency. So maybe I'll come to you first, Catherine, and just maybe ask us to introduce yourself, the Microinsurance Network. And then maybe you can follow that up by telling us, you know, what inclusive insurance really is and why it's important. Great. Uh, oh, I'm very loud. Um, right. So thank you all for coming today. And especially we really appreciate the time of the two insurers because this session was designed very much to bring the development community and the Luxembourg insurance community together. Um, in a meeting of two worlds. So very briefly, what is the microinsurance network or what do we do? Um, we bring together organizations that are committed to solving a very, very big problem. Uh, and that is prob the problem is that 70 to 80% of the world's population is extremely vulnerable to adverse events because they do not have insurance cover, including adequate social protection. So with our members from more than 60 countries and with the uh, invaluable and long-term support of the Luxembourg government over the last more than a decade, we work on closing this prote people protection gap by raising awareness, sharing be best practice, building capacity and monitoring progress through our flagship land landscape report. Now, when it comes to what is sustainable insurance, um, and inclusive insurance is very much part of that, um, I think it's good to go back to definitions. And sustainability was originally defined by the United Nations Brundtland Commission in 1987 as meeting the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. It goes way beyond green bonds. Um, so with respect to sustainable insurance specifically, 
insurers are in the business of risk. And risk is becoming more complex and more compound and, quite frankly, bigger. So that means that the protection gap is growing, it's not shrinking, and as we've learned in the last couple of years, natural disasters, climate change, disease, these do not respect borders. So our rapidly changing world really means that we need new thinking if we're going to, if we're going to survive, and if the insurance sector as a sector will survive. So sustainability is also about that, about remaining relevant, doing the job that it's supposed to do, and all working together uh, to make it through, quite frankly, because we do face uh, what have been termed these poly crises. I'll stop there, Matt. Thanks. Thanks for that little uh, explanation and history lesson. I always appreciate a bit of history. Um, Laura, could you introduce yourself and explain what you do at AXA Emerging Markets? Yeah, well, first of all, uh, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks a lot for the invitation to the panel. Um, I work at the Inclusive Insurance Division of AXA, which is called AXA Emerging Customers. Um, and our mission is to make insurance affordable, relevant, and valuable um, to people that for different reasons, be it income, being occupational status, being health conditions, today lack access to insurance. We are uh, currently working in more than 14 markets in Asia, Africa, Latin America, and more recently also in Europe. Um, and at the end of 2021, we covered 9.5 million customers with this inclusive insurance solution. So how do we, how do we describe our business? Um, this is basically protection that's tailored um, to these vulnerable segments. And we basically start from the client um, to, let's say, come up with uh, the right level of protection. It's not only um, insurance products that have a very small premium, uh, but it's also about the risks that they covered, the way that they are distributed. Um, and today, at least in emerging countries, our model is very much based um, on a partnership uh, model. It means that we look out for uh, distribution partners of different uh, nature from mobile network operators, to mobile wallets, to microfinance institutions, um, to even partnering with governments to make insurance much more uh, approachable um, and to close that proximity gap with the people that need um, insurance the most. Thanks. I look forward to hearing some examples of how, how you're doing that, maybe a bit later on. But um, Victoria, could you yeah, in introduce yourself and explain what yeah. AMBEST does? And, and Absolutely. Hi, everyone. My name is uh, Victoria Oharadnik. I am an associate director in AMBEST. AMBEST is a global rating agency that specializes solely on the insurance sector. We are, as I mentioned, a global organization. We have offices um, in seven different cities in the world. I am based in our Amsterdam office. From our Amsterdam office, we focus on the ratings that are within the EU. Uh, we had to relocate uh, to Amsterdam or split our offices from London to Amsterdam post-Brexit. So, you know, that was a nice little benefit for me to be able to move there. I'm originally from our headquarters in the U.S. Um, and out of our office in, the, in, uh, in Amsterdam, um, the portfolio that I follow is predominantly big global um, multinational insurers and reinsurers um, through our... and we. we focus uh, mainly on just uh, the ratings uh, section of what AMBEST does. Um, ESG has become increasingly a much more important topic. Um, I think it's, uh, it's, it's uh, important for me to clarify that we do not do ESG-specific ratings, so we do not assign ESG ratings. However, ESG has always been part of our rating methodology. Um, our methodology is based on what we call a building block approach. So we would focus on assessing a company's balance sheet strength, company's operating performance, business profile, uh, and ERM. And ESG is specifically embedded within those building blocks. And um, hopefully we're going to talk about that a little bit later on. But uh, ESG is critical to the overall uh, issuer credit rating of a company and the overall financial strength of insurance. And it's definitely not a fad. Um, we spend a lot of time discussing this with, with our companies, with our rated uh, universe. 
Well, th yeah, I'm going to I'm going to stick on the issue of it, of ESG because I think it's it's really important to focus on that. And maybe I'll, I'll come to you straight away. Like you know, we are seeing, um, you know, ESG is being talked about more, much more, especially in the financial sector here in Europe, in the developing se in development kind of sector. Maybe a little bit less so in the in the financial sectors in the developing market. But can you just kind of give us uh, an insight into why ESG is important and how you assess it? Yeah, that's a very good question, and I prepared a slide on this one because I think it's, it's, it's quite a lot to, to tackle, and I thought a visual would be helpful. So as I mentioned before, we follow what we call a building block approach to developing a company's rating. So uh, before you on the screen, you see the four main categories. Of course, there's more. Um, and ESG is intertwined within all of those categories. Now, we, we try to... Uh, you know, categorize different types of risks under the different uh, building blocks. However, I think it's, it's important to point out that they're all intertwined. So one risk has an impact on various portions of the overall rating. So, for example, uh, when we look at a company's balance sheet strength, uh, we have a lot of internal models that we run. There's a lot of uh, qualitative and, and quantitative aspects to that. So when we look at climate risk, we want to assess how well a company is you know, financially capable to take on various risks and be able to withstand losses. You know, how well are they capitalized for the business that they are trying to underwrite? Um, also, we look at uh, a company's uh, balance sheet uh, from the investment point of view. Uh, and here we try to focus on uh, uh, risks that companies are exposed to based on the type of investments that they focus on. Uh, and we particularly look for industries uh, that would be potentially, you know, characterized as stranded assets later on. So an example would be uh, investing in, you know, tobacco bonds or, or, or something <coughs> coal-related or those kind of industries where the value of your investments can go down significantly to the point that there's no liquidity there, there's no market for selling them, and that exposes a company's balance sheet. Uh, when we look at operating performance, we, we look at the trends of how well a company underwrites its business, how well you know, the pricing is, what are the investment returns like. And here, from the ESG perspective, we focus on social inflation. Uh, we focus on ESG-related litigation, which can be quite pricey. Um, in, in the US particularly, social inflation has been a huge topic and a huge focus for us. There is a lot of um, ESG-related uh, uh, nuclear verdicts, so that can, be, that can really impact a company's operating performance, which can then flow through and impact a company's balance sheet strength. Um, business profile, again, we, we assess how well a company manages various ESG-related risks. And again, if there's ESG-related litigation that can certainly hurt a company's uh, overall profile, you know, losing customers, reputational risk, uh, if there's a big uh, data breach, that, that's also considered, we consider that to be an ESG-related uh, breach. Um, and you know, enterprise risk management, I think that's the simplest one to look at from an ESG perspective as well, because, you know, the G in governance falls exactly into our assessment of enterprise risk management. Um, and I think this is just an overview. I can spend a lot of time discussing each of these points, but uh, maybe I'll, I'll leave that for questions later on in the day. Thanks. Maybe I'll come to you first. Being a, an insurer yourself, all these terms must be quite familiar to you. I, I just love this slide because <laughs> this basically summarizes the why ESG is important. So it's not only a matter of, um, you know, doing good, which should be a matter enough, but like yep. this is really rooted in business, exactly. right? Yeah. So, and could you tell us what AXA is doing in this, in this, in this space? Um, yeah. yeah. So, well, the, I, I think that the scope is quite broad um, and I think insurance companies have uh, the beauty of being in an industry that intrinsically does good. Um, you know, it's not the tobacco industry, it's not the coal industry, it's not the arms industry. So fundamentally, that's, that's a very positive starting point. Um, it has an enormous power as well. Um, it, the insurance sector is one of the biggest investors and, and long-term investors around the world for governments, for corporations. And this intrinsically means there's a huge power and responsibility of 
uh, using that capital uh, to fund uh, the transition of the world to, to make towards something more sustainable. Uh, at the, the flip side, as, as Victoria was highlighting, is that the more you start, um, you know, it, there's, there's a possibility of better, better using your assets uh, for, uh, to fund sort of this transformation, but there's also the piece around liabilities. Uh, and on the liabilities part, climate change is making in the world intrinsically less insurable, uh, more extreme events, more difficult to, uh, to model risks, more, more difficult to, um, to, to, to basically uh, underwrite. Um, and, and that's only on the environmental side, but there's also a piece on the social aspect that is sometimes left behind. Um, that is, the, the less customers are able to acquire your products, that's intrinsically bad for business as well. It means that ultimately the market is not going to be the size that, that it is today. And so there are, there are many different initiatives, I think is something that I, that I wanted to share here today, is that it's a multidisciplinary effort in an organization. So there is people that are working in the business uh, that are more and more um, aware about the responsibility that they carry on their day-to-day -day jobs. But there's also uh, a lot of dedicated people to ESG matters. And Ax Emerging Customers <coughs> is just one example of them. We have a team of experts. We, our, our job is basically to bring and advocate for the customer reality on the design of more inclusive insurance solutions. But we have that all along the value chain. So we have it on the way we do investments. We have it on the way we underwrite uh, risks and what type of corporate uh, policies we accept. Um, and so uh, today, I think uh, something very different from back in 2015. So AXA was one of the first companies that made this very big, bold uh, global move of divest from carbon. And at the time, there was well, quite a lot of questioning on whether, you know, this was going to be the right move, whether it was really a risk or not. And, and now, you know, the fact that stranded assets appear as kind of a bullet point on the strength of a balance sheet sort of proves that it's a, it's a big deal for, for insurance companies. Um, so that is just one of the pillars, the, 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 the efforts on investments, and there's the big effort um, on insurance. And within insurance, you have from green products, the way that you address solutions to end customers, uh, thinking about elements like how do we help communities build back better using better types of materials or uh, using more sustainable construction practices to uh, the effort on you know, the, the new ways of mobility and what types of solutions we design there. And then more importantly, within the area that it's my subject is, how do we make insurance intrinsically more accessible to people that have never had insurance before? If we take a picture today of, uh, of the population, there, we estimate that between 70 to 85% of people in emerging countries have never had insurance before. This is a massive number. It's a massive number in terms of the social risk, but it's also a huge opportunity for insurance companies. And that has really been the strategic driver for the creation of X Emerging Customers, is this conviction that we can do well by doing good. Mm -hmm. That's really interesting. Um, Catherine, you being the director of the network who is made up of organizations who are pushing for inclusive uh, insurance, how is ESG being discussed within, within your members? And is there a difference between those who are in Europe and, and those that are in, in the South? Well, we have a, vi a very diverse membership, as you know. Mm. And I think um, it's not as straightforward as a division between Global North and Global mm. South, in addition to which uh, we have different stakeholder groups uh, represented. So uh, with, with those caveats, um, um, I, I, I think my, I thought quite long and hard about this actually because I think it's very much front of mind for the large insurers such as AXA, Allianz um, uh, and, and other members such as that. Uh, for members in, in uh, emerging markets, I have to say this is 
Um, well, I think the first thing that I would say is that even in emerging markets and developing countries, the number of insurers, if you look at it as a percentage of all the licensed insurers that are actually active in trying to build um, access products, reaching uh, the customer base beyond the, let me call them the usual suspects, and the usual suspects are uh, corporate clients and salaried employees, and in these markets that represents at most 30% of the population. So um, the effort that is being made globally to reach these customers is simply not enough. Um, and what we find is in each market there are a few firms that are really concentrating. And whether they call that, uh, label that ESG or not, I think it's a matter of semantics. And that was why I started out with this, you know, 30, 40 year old definition of sustainability, because this is nothing new. Um, so I think it's, it's very good that uh, what is meant by ESG and sustainability is being clarified um, in the European Union and elsewhere. But I think the, the, the important thing is the substance and not to, to sort of overcome this perception that it adds red tape. Mm -hmm. um, because actually the intention behind it is to bring in sustainability, which as you will have gathered from what I already said, is sustainability in the, in the broad sense of the word. So um, if insurance, like other sectors, wants to flourish as a sector, uh, that includes um, the financial sector as well, uh, you need to have stability, you need to have less income inequality, not more income inequality. And this creates the stability and fabric that we need to see an emerging middle class, which again drives further stability. Um, and, and I think that's what, what everybody wants. So in terms of do the members in the global south um, or developing countries, uh, are they as aware of it? I would say no, they aren't. Um, and I think that's uh, you know, very clear from different discussions. Um, I think this might be a bit of a, um, how can I put it, a first world obsession, I think is, is mm. how we might have put it in the old days. But the need for sustainability itself and the awareness of the importance of that is, um, is very much on the table as it always has been. I know that last week um, the African Insurance Organization had their annual conference uh, in Nairobi and um, there was a lot of attention uh, around microinsurance. Um, they had a session on that. They have a working group that focuses on that. And there was some confusion apparently from participants about why this wasn't more on the agenda. And let me be very clear, um, as, as Laura has said, when we use this term microinsurance, we're talking about the target consumers, not about sachet insurance. It might include mm. sachet insurance, but it includes far more than that. And um, so I think there is a need for building awareness around sustainability is not a CSR ex exercise. It's something that is absolutely fundamental and necessary for survival of businesses, of the customers, um, and of the planet itself, or the species anyway. So let's, um, let's break down ESG into different sections and we can focus on the, the S for the social. And I know you wrote an article recently that was stated that you, you, you wanted to put the S back into ESG. Can you just explain what you mean by that? Yes, so I think, um, you know, we face um, an existential crisis in the form of climate change and the need to take climate action. Um, and perhaps because of that, and perhaps because the climate action lobby has been remarkably successful in, in getting attention, perhaps because, you know, when we see these changes in the weather, it's right on our doorstep. Um, the, the fact that this impacts people and the incredible social divide that exists um, has been a little bit ignored, I think. Um, it's starting to change. Um, we're starting to see uh, how global representatives of the insurance sector and elsewhere also taking up this 
um, mantra of, you know, let's put the S back in ESG. Right. But let me be very clear, the E, the S and the G are inextricably linked. Right. Um, so, uh, you know, I think one should be very clear, and particularly in the Luxembourg context where a green, e, the E or sustainability seems to mean purely things that are around green bonds. This is not the case. This is, um, this is a financial instrument. We need to think a lot more widely, deeply, broadly, and actively to get the results to take us forward. And that means addressing the S. Yes, it's important to have diversity um, and equal opportunity and representation within our firms. It's important to have a pipeline of women and girls taking STEM subjects so that they end up in the financial sector, the engineering sector and other sectors where women are underrepresented. But most importantly, um, you know, I think those are starting points. They're important starting points, but how can we look ourselves in the mirror on a planet where you know, as, as Laura has also said, 70 to 80 percent of, of, our, of our global citizens of the planet are excluded. You know, that's mm. why we think it is so important, especially because it is in these vulnerable countries that people are most exposed to the impact of climate risk. You know, this is about crop failures, this is about houses being um, flooded, you've seen the impact of the, this monsoon season in, in Mumbai. These are costs that people cannot simply cover on their own. Laura, let me come to you uh, next as the, as the insurer. What, 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 what <coughs> can insurance companies do you know, in this dimension rather than just kind of increasing the number of female employees in, in management areas? What, what else can they, can they re really do? Right, I, I think that's, as Catherine was saying, the, the starting point because representation is relevant and it impacts the products that you design and who you sell it and, and, how, you, and how you sell it. Uh, but, but in particular, I think the social aspect on, uh, on insurance, on designing insurance solutions, is really going back to, the, back to the clients. And it sounds as a very simple answer, but it's something that we, we sometimes as an industry forget is who are these clients, uh, who are we trying to serve, what are they expecting, what do they need. Um, and, and this has really been for us something that has allowed us to adapt our insurance solutions and more importantly generate more awareness of its importance. Uh, we, we completed a, a quite a number of uh, focus groups and, and we did research in particular in France last year where uh, the numbers for us, are, are, our initial hypothesis was, well, let's see if there's an opportunity for inclusive insurance in a country like France where, you know, social security systems are so strong and uh, it's one of the largest economies in the world. Maybe there's something that needs to be done. We were, we knew there was something, we were just not expecting how big it was. And uh, basically, when you look at the population of France, uh, we identify that nearly 18 million people are living in households that are considered mother, modest households. What this means is households that live uh, with earnings or income between 60 and 90% of the median income. Um, and what we discover there is that over the years, the, the constraint expenses on the, these households' income has increased disproportionately compared to the salaries increase. Insurance is, a, is seen as a constrained expense. And uh, even if this modest households understand the importance of insurance, uh, it's uh, reaching a point where they are arbitrating between paying for insurance or making other financial decisions. The level of income constraint in these modest households uh, is so dire that by the 10th of the month, they have less than 100 euros for unexpected events uh, or for discretionary spending. Um, we, were not, we were really not expecting these this, this types of insights. And interestingly enough, they were saying, well, given how little margin I have to face unexpected events on the month, I actually think that insurance is a critical tool for me to be able to manage 
that income volatility. It's a, it's a critical tool for these households. The big question mark was, how can I continue paying for premiums that are getting more and more expensive and my salary is just not increasing at the same pace? So for us, this was a wake-up call and there's a lot of work that we're doing in trying to understand also the context in other mature markets. Uh, there was a, a, there's a very interesting uh, paper from the Swiss Reinstitute, if you have some time to read it, I think it's the, the May issue where they were linking uh, the, the, the issue of social inequality and its threat to the insurance industry. Uh, and I left with a very interesting insight of it, which said, they estimated that if the inequality levels had stayed the same uh, to that of 1990, the insurance industry premiums in mature countries in 2019 could have been 252 billion euros bigger. That's a huge number. That's a lost market opportunity. And so fighting social inequality with a tool so, so important as insurance is in itself good for business. So that, that's a bit the way that, that we are starting to, to see it. We, we are seeing the need, we are seeing vulnerability, and uh, we are trying to design solutions to help households manage that vulnerability. It has not only to do with income, it has also to do with occupation. Um, another example from France, is that the number of micro enterprises in the country is really exploding. The labor landscape in, in, in France is evolving. And uh, the way that the social security system and, and insurance overall is working was based on the fundamental assumption that everybody had a full-time work contract. This is not the case anymore. This is changing. And there are protection gaps that are rising because of this transformation of labor. Think about gig economy workers. Think about uh, self-employed people, these micro-entrepreneurs. There is a huge protection gap that's starting to build up and that we are not seeing uh, today as an opportunity. There's a role that insurance companies can play in closing that protection gap, even in, in mature countries. And, you know, for, for emerging markets, Catherine said it, a large percentage of the population are informal workers. They don't have a formal work contract. Social security systems are much more vulnerable. And so the need uh, in magnitude mm. is significant. But let's not forget, since we're, we're in Europe, uh, let's not forget that there's also a lot to be done um, at home. It's really interesting because the insurance industry isn't really recognized as being the most responsive and quick to adapt to these, to these changes, but it's important that they do kind of follow these trends and adapt their services to the needs, to the yeah. changing needs. Um, let's move on to the environment. I would like to ask a yeah. question that I, I, I've been curious about. So in, in your view, Alara and Catherine, do you think the, the, the well, I, I wanted to say recent pandemic, but maybe ongoing pandemic is, is the better word. Do you think that did something to, to you know, spur companies and, and governments to put the S back in ESG? Do you think there was a positive momentum from the pandemic? Yeah, maybe, maybe I can respond to that. So I think the... Um, they have, you know, they, we say in English that it's an ill wind that blows no good. And um, we have seen a number of significant positive factors coming out of this. So I think one is this awareness um, of the importance of health and life insurance and the extent to pe which people were covered. I would couple that with some kind of in income protection, remembering that in, in many countries people didn't have access to furlough or... Um, help from the state in order to survive was a knock-on <coughs> impact. In the microfinance sector, we, you know, we know there was a, a very good uh, report put out by Grameen Credit Echo Foundation and another partner um, that showed the slowdown in that kind of activity. But yes, I think it's been a big wake-up call. So I think that is, it's been a wake-up call for, for governments and companies. It's been a wake-up call for consumers. So we saw a massive, it was a, it was a trend that had already begun, um, but was definitely confirmed in our, our last landscape research, the demand for health insurance. So the, um, and this is typically hospital cash insurance, which is an, an income replacement. Um, and then the third thing I'd say, which I'm most excited about, um, <laughs> is, of course, it forced everyone to accelerate digitalization. 
and the way to reach hard to reach people and also automate uh, back office processes, cutting costs, speeding things up. This is definitely the way to go with, um, along with paying attention, of course, that it doesn't unintentionally exclude segments of, of the population. So yes, I think there were very, very positive um, upsides mm -hmm. of that. And, um, you know, certainly I, I participate in some other international forums. Um, and I have definitely seen um, uh, une prise de conscience. Um, um, I know what you mean. Yeah. yeah. Awareness. Thanks. Well, I certainly hope that that momentum continues and, and we see some real changes from that. Yeah. So um, I'm just looking at the time and I've got someone telling me we're running out of time. I need to put, do questions to the, to the, to the, to the audience, but... Um, Maybe just moving, my last question will be moving to the financial inclusion side, which is core, the core business for, for ADA. And if I'm not mistaken, in this kind of ESG framework evaluation, financial inclusion represents about 20 questions over about 1,000 questions, which is kind of uh, gives an indication of the importance that financial inclusion uh, is given. How, how can that be the case? Maybe I'll come to you first. Um. I think financial, so that questionnaire, uh, we are not personally I'm involved not blaming you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I wish we were, we are not. So as a rating agency, I think I, I, I will have to kind of pass that on maybe I to an insurer. <laughs> I, I think I can give you my perspective is that the fact is ESG is way broader than financial inclusion. It's indeed an important component but it, it cuts across the whole value chain. It cuts across how you treat your employees, how fairly do you pay them, uh, who are your employees, who are your distributors, who are your providers, um, how do you, do you actually have metrics to prove uh, that you have an ESG strategy in place? Uh, you know, what are you doing on the, on the, mm. on the investment side, on, on the insurance side? So it, it, it's really broad and for us and for me, financial inclusion is by far the preferred chapter of it. Uh, but I think the, the angle overall is that an insurance company is, is bigger than uh, you know, the, the, the financial inclusion part. It doesn't mean that it's not as important. It just means that you know, if uh, you are doing microinsurance, but at the same time you have call centers with, you know, where you're paying people and treating people poorly, you know, like it's, it's the way that you conduct the business and that you conduct yourself as a company that's also really relevant. And so mm. I, I think this is, this is a bit what's behind it. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd go along. I, I agree because it's, it, one has to think of this as a portfolio. So, I mean, mm. you mentioned uh, 20 questions out of 1,000. I think that's uh, roughly 5%, but I can't do maths in my head. So, um, you know, there are other, there are many, many considerations. I think what, what we would like to see is just a recognition that this one doesn't get overlooked because we yeah. certainly know, based on the SP Global research, that it is really an area of underperformance by the insurance sector at large. And we're here to help, you know, not to, mm -hmm. we, we see it as an important issue. Um, and, and I think, you know, all of us in our personal capacities is a, there's the moral imperative, but I think, yes, it can be good for business. Definitely. And the, the insurance companies have a responsibility as well, I think, to uh, you know, expand the market, expand their services to those who are not, who don't currently have access to it. So let me open the floor to questions from the audience. So if you do have a question, can you can you raise your hand? Maybe state your name, where you are, what organisation you're from, and who you're directing your question to, please. So. My name is Kankan Halda. I'm from a uh, journalist. We're from Chronicle.lu. And uh, first question, I have a couple of. <laughs> first would be to uh, Laura from, uh, sorry, for, to Victoria from the uh, ratings agency. Do you rate AXA and microinsurance? If yes, how they rate? First. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So. Yes, you're, you're, you're going for the hard ones. <laughs> uh, so I cannot comment on, on specific company ratings or, or go into any detail about sensitive information. Uh, 
I think overall we do have a rating on OXA. I don't know what it is off the top of my head, but we don't specifically, we wouldn't specifically rate um, a particular division of, of, a, of a company. We do what we call a holistic approach where we assess the enterprise-wide, um, you know, financial, uh, you know, strength, operating performance and all that. We do that on a holistic basis. Um, and typically that rating would flow through to various subsidiaries of that organization. So while that answers, uh, it, it also steps back from your, uh, the positive note where you put someone on spotlight and let them make work. But okay, that's fine. Mm -hmm. uh, the second question would be... But can I say uh, something? Yeah, please. please. Um, so I, I think maybe, maybe something to, to take into account, at least from AXA's perspective, is we published uh, sort of an accountability metric that is called the AXA for Progress Index. Um, and within the AXA for Progress Index, we have made commitments across different dimensions of ESG. Uh, which you can see and, and it's publicly available. It's included in our integrated report and, and on the annual report on those activities. Um, so I think it's, it's a powerful tool for companies to do some soul searching. And it's not only about measuring, but it's also about def defining the commitments and then sticking to them. Um, and another important consideration of that is that uh, the, the executive's long-term compensation has a contribution of uh, the performance on the Standard & Poor's uh, Sustainability Index. Um, and so it's, you know, just, just to highlight that there's publicly available information in case you, you want to look into it. So I will continue with another question for uh, you, Victoria. It would be in the ESG, the first is environment. And given the global geopolitical situation where a lot of companies are excluded, like for, for example, the shipping in Russia is now excluded from insurance, big insur insurers do not insure anymore. But just as uh, uh, Catherine mentioned that once something happens, then it's not just somewhere else, but it's for the whole world to take care. Like if a ship breaks down midway, it's the whole ocean is getting dirty. So how these political uh, uh, decisions affect insurance companies to make a really global approach and not just all the time trying to figure out who is doing what we would not restrict our decisions to Iran or this or that, but that makes a lot of problems for you, right? Where you have to be careful you do not step on the government policies. What is your uh, outlook on that from an ESG point of view? Does that heavily, moderately restrict your insurance in environmental point of view? Look, that specific <laughs> example, I think it's, it's a little bit outside of my area of expertise, but what I would tell you personally, um, is that it takes courage. What the example I was giving on the divestment from coal was a first move uh, from a global insurance company. And at the time, there was a huge question mark from investors, from even employees. Uh, you know, coal was an industry that was doing quite well. It was, you know, attractive returns. Uh, then the divestment from tobacco, you know, quite a profitable industry if you just see it from a, a pure investment perspective. Um, at the same time, it didn't match with AXA's long-term vision and strategy, uh, what it stood for. Yes, it was great from an asset perspective, but, you know, lung cancer on your health portfolios, uh, you know, it's an issue. So uh, it, it, it's about seeing things and, and their, their interconnections around the business. That's, that's what's really important. And obviously, we will always need to navigate sort of this uh, geopolitical intricacies one way or the other. Um, there will always need to be decisions that, that are made that have, you know, to one extent or the other uh, consequences. I would like to also add that from a rating agency perspective, for a company not being able to comply with sanctions is a failure of governance. So that's clearly linked to ESG. Um, yeah, compliance is, is of utmost importance. And uh, we spend a lot of time talking to companies' senior management team to understand how they manage each of the risks that are the most relevant to their type of business. So obviously there will be some differences between a company that is more exposed to natural catastrophes versus a company that is a, a life and health provider. Uh, so we really drill deep to understand you know, how that flows through in our methodology and what it does to the overall credit rating. Now, an interesting development that happened a few years ago was that uh, ESMA, the um, UK regulator, 
um, introduced a new mandate for rating agencies that said if a company's rating is moved predominantly, the, the main driver of, of a move in rating um, is an ESG factor, and that means either an upgrade, a downgrade, a rating change. So if it was due to an ESG factor, we have to explicitly state that in our publication. So even though that only applied to our London uh, office, uh, AMBES actually decided to implement this policy globally for all our offices. So since this was implemented uh, you know, over two years now, we, we track some metrics on this to see you know, how, how, how important is ESG, you know, how, how many rating changes are directly linked to ESG. So um, over the past uh, two years, roughly between 10 and 15% of all rating action changes, so not affirmations, changes, are linked directly to an, an ESG factor. So it, it's critical. Yeah, it, it, it's definitely not a fad. I know that there are still some skeptics in the world, but at least you know, from a re regulatory perspective, from a rating agency analysis, we take that very seriously. Well, thank you. One last question, it's, if it's okay. Uh, I'm not seeing any other hands. There uh, is one here. So okay. One would be just okay. in terms of governance, because selling a product from environmental or social is much easier. And in that way, indirectly, you are saying that the customers have a saying in environmental and social aspect of ESG. <coughs> However, there are very or no, almost non-existent products in terms of governance where the customers can choose between two products in terms of governance. Can you, can you, can you give some insights where some products are more like for a customer to buy insurance which is based on governance and as a customer I have a choice between different governances. Do you have something like this in your portfolio or you think something like this exists? To be honest, uh, I've not heard of anything like this existing. Maybe, maybe others well, have. Well, it has to do with the solidity of the company, sure. right? So governance yeah. has to do with the processes that are in yeah. place, the fact that you know, yeah. the, the board is composed of uh, and has representation of, of these type of, uh, of X, Y, Z types of profiles, uh, the fact that are, there are committees that are overlooking into uh, company decisions. It, it all boils down to the solidity of the company and who you yeah. want to give your money, right? If, if it, it has to do with governance is really linked to reputation in the end. Um, and uh, this is why it's so critical uh, for uh, an insurance company to, to, to kind of manage that um, on, a, on, a, on a balanced way. Now, from, from, a, from a customer's perspective, it would be interesting to, to get your insights on, you know, as a, as a customer, what would customers be, be looking at uh, when, when you discuss sort of this G dimension? Yeah, I think from, from, from us, when we think about the G, it's, it's not about a specific product that a company offers, it's about the risk management within their organization. Because you can have, you know, the best available products, you can have the best policies on paper, but if your governance fails, if you can't comply with your own, you know, set of rules that you've developed for yourself that you're going to operate in this space, that really undermines the whole organization. And, and a good governance framework is, is key to the sustainability and, and you know, the long-term survival of any insurance company. Thank you. Uh, for for Jürgen, and then to... Yeah, sorry, Jürgen, ha Jürgen Hammer from SPDF, Social Performance Task Force, so SPDF Europe here in Luxembourg. Two very quick questions, one to Victoria. Um, in microfinance, for a long time, we, the rating world in microfinance has uh, separated financial ratings and social ratings, and even going further, in addition to social rating, a, spe a specific focus on client protection, customer protection. Because mixing that or having as ESG as an influencing factor of a larger rating, of course, waters it down. Uh, and it, it it's obviously doesn't, I mean, there's a lot of things that can be reflected. Are there any of such thoughts in the rating in the insurance sector? That's one question to you. And a quick question to uh, Laura Elena. A fantastic example, it's great to hear. All this work, AXA, I mean, has a good reputation on that, and it's great to hear that. But just one question. The methodologies and tools that you use internally for evaluation, do you currently already exchange them with a the larger insurance sector to assure that that kind of reporting and evaluation do achieve transparency in terms of readability? Thank you very much. <laughs> To, uh, so to answer your first question, I think there are always talks 
uh, among rating agencies and you know various publications I've read, uh, I think the desire is there to be as transparent as possible regarding what impacts a particular rating, but also um, you know, an ESG assessment. So for example, I know other rating agencies are attempting, or, or maybe some are more successful than others, in implementing ESG assessments that kind of drill deeper into um, you know, the E, the S, and the G, and, and provide companies better feedback like this. Uh, AMBEST currently does not do that, but I would say that that's not out, out of the question. Um, I think you know the role of, of AMBEST, what we try to do is we try to be as transparent as possible with what we think impacts a financial strength of a company. Um, and, and as Catherine made that point earlier, there's a clear linkage between a healthy and robust insurance industry and a good economic you know, development of a country. I think those things kind of move in tandem. So, uh, you know, from that perspective, um, you know, whatever feedback we may or may not give on, on ESG to clients directly, um, I think would be helpful. Um, so again, it's not a, out of the question that, you know, something like that could be developed in the future. On, on my side, <clears throat> I would say on the, on the E, uh, this is this is mirroring a bit the, the movement of the industry, right? So this is where things are much more advanced, and so AXA is part of the of the task force for climate-related financial disclosures, for the task force of nature-related financial disclosures, and so they, they they are part of they are sitting at the table. AXA is sitting at the table on the discussion of how exactly you measure, you know. Uh, this, this impact and in particular for the investment side of the portfolio kind of this notion of the warming potential of your assets is, is quite a complex dimension, right? And it's still in the making and this is something that is being co-built uh, with, uh, with a multidisciplinary um, sort of group of, of, of experts. Uh, that's that's on, the, on the E side and there are many things that we publish, you know, uh, annual reports on on climate, on biodiversity, on uh, green business, etc. <coughs> the social part is something that mirroring the industry is a little bit behind. How do we measure this social impact from the activities of insurance? And we've been working, we have some internal elements we've discussed with impact investors, uh, we've discussed with the members of the microinsurance network on what would be the right indicators to follow um, how are they linked to the sustainab sustainable development goals? There's also the European Union taxonomy. This is also something that, that AXA is quite involved in, in having this conversation um, with, with public actors on, on, on all this kind of regulatory framework. Uh, but on the social part, this is something that is a bit behind climate. Um, and so, yeah, we would be happy to exchange on, on ideas. Uh, we already have a framework, it's not public. Uh, but it is there, and we are getting prepared for when you know when is the the moment to to start being more more explicit about it. But it includes things from understanding who your clients are, how much claims uh, you are paying from your products, what percentage are uh, women, what percentage are uh, people uh, of more than 60 years old, how, what percentage of people are from rural areas, etc. So kind of all these social dimensions are, is something that we are starting to stabilize in our internal framework. And you know, when the time is right, I think we'll be, we'll be there. Thanks. I think there's one more question. I think, yeah. This was my question for the social impact because I'm always focused on the social. I'm Nicole from Africa Business Tour. So I'm very, this, uh, the social impact is my focus. So I'm very happy <laughs> to understand that you say that and I can also help you for, to fulfill it, this. Thank, Thank you. It Thank takes you. collaborative <laughs> teamwork. Can you just pass the mic behind you, Laura? To the lady behind you, yeah. And we'll just take that last question and then I think we'll close. Yeah, I'm get, getting a nod. I'm sorry. Can we, we, you, you can find them afterwards during while we eat. <laughs> Thank you. My name is Lydia Afonso and I, am, I just joined Deloitte Luxembourg in um, one of their units working with the EU um, in, in several areas. 
Um, and my question is about um, the digital and digitalization process that has taken place uh, during COVID, but also before. Um, um, I am aware that uh, digitalization and the level of digitalization and mobile coverage and all of that in several countries uh, has made a huge difference in, in microfinance in general and in financial inclusion. But I wanted to hear if you've got examples of specifically how that has impacted the, the insurance side. Maybe I can yeah. start and I'm sure you can compliment. Um, it's been revolutionary um, in, in, in these markets. And the, the reason for this is, you know, sometimes when we think of digitalization, uh, this is a very broad spread. You know, this goes from... Uh, moving things from paper-based enrollment and claims procedures, which you can imagine uh, would be a bit of a nightmare, but have been very much the reality in many places um, until recently, uh, all the way through to very co complex applications of AI and blockchain and, and so on. And, you know, the first thing that we've, we've seen is Yes, digitalization in um, improving access to insurance has been dramatic. It didn't start, it started off very simply by using mobile phone technology to engage with customers using SSID um, interactions. Um, other, other technologies that have come along like WhatsApp in some jurisdictions, um, clients can file claims using WhatsApp pictures. Um, it, it makes it much more accessible and easier, and most importantly, um, from the back office side, as more of these systems have become integrated and digitalized, it means that costs have come down. Um, costs have come down, also the time to service claims uh, seem <laughs> is improving. This is, it's not a straight line, it depends on the risk that is covered, it depends on the market. Um, but there have been some very positive examples and uh, also with the use of parametric insurance. So um, for it, the impact not just on um, the produce of, of smallholder farmers uh, around the world, but, but also even in cities um, with early warning systems, flooding, typhoons um, and so on. So there, there has been an enormous application and it's, it's definitely ramping up. Just I just compliment to say digitization can, shouldn't only be seen from an access perspective. Uh, there's a, a huge power of digitization on decreasing operational costs. If we only see it from an access perspective, there is a risk of leaving people behind, leaving women, elder people, uh, and people in rural areas behind, just because intrinsically they have less access to mobile phones. It doesn't mean that it's bad, but it's something we need to look at and we need to um, kind of accompany customers in this transition towards the digital world. So yes, there's, there are a lot of smartphones. Yes, Facebook and social networks are everywhere, but the use of financial, digital financial services and the use of the smartphone from a behavioral perspective is significantly different in these segments of the population. So we, we always need to take into account who are we addressing the insurance product to um, and, and what the best way to do that is. So um, we talk a lot about digital models. Digital means a combination between physical and digital. And so when you think about M-Pesa, for example, yes, it's mobile money, but there are hundreds of thousands of agents on every single corner across Kenya where you can cash in and cash out money. So it's this transition between the digital and the physical world that's really critical for financial inclusion overall. There's, there's no point on having millions of mobile money accounts if people are not using them. And, and that today is, you know, a, a, a bit the, the, the only nuance that I would make on this. It's for sure the future. Mm -hmm. But, you know, there needs to be a, an inclusive transition towards uh, digital financial services. Thanks. Thanks for that. We're a big fan of the digital in, in ADA. <laughs> um, just to uh, close up, a call for action. What, can, what would you advise the audience to do uh, to, in order to push this agenda? Well, I would really welcome contact from anyone who's interested to, uh, you know, to see how 
you know, we at the network can support with you engaging more with inclusive insurance. Um, it's, uh, it's something I've mentioned in the past, but uh, we have relatively few members in Luxembourg, and yet we've been based here for, for 20, 20 years. years. And um, it's a mystery to me uh, why that is. Um, we don't smell. Um, not much. <laughs> um, and yeah, I would encourage you, if you're curious, if you're interested, get in touch. We have a number of our team here. We have our office near the GAP. We have a website and we even answer emails. Uh, we're not hard to find. Read our newsletter. It's free. Um, and, you know, if you want to support the work that we're doing, because we are on our own journey towards sustainability, um, become a member become an individual member or an institutional member. Uh, we need the support and that drives the work that we do in the markets that really need it. And you might even meet some very cool people. <laughs> exactly. Laura. Um, I'd say that it, it's not something that an insurance company is going to tackle on its own. And fortunately, right now, there are so many working groups, task force, uh, association, the microinsurance network being the best, <laughs> I have to say. But, you know, it's about joining forces, it's, uh, be it within the sector, be it with public actors, be it with other industries. There, there is a lot that can be done when we kind of build these bridges. Um, and for us, that, that has also been key. Advancing critical and solving world problems cannot be done by one company alone. It, it needs to be a sectoral effort. Partnerships. Yeah, yeah. I think those were both very excellent suggestions. I'll just sort of tack on to this. I think it's very important to keep the conversation going, to keep the momentum going. This is, this is not a fad. This is not the hot new topic to focus on. This is here to stay. We need to make active changes. Um, for the insurance industry, I would, I would say that uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very powerful industry with a lot of powerful players. I think when public and, and private sectors come together, they can really make change, you know, positive changes in the emerging markets. Um, and, and I would say that, uh, you know, insurance industries, uh, insurance companies should continue to, you know, use innovation to develop these, uh, these innovative solutions that could help bridge the social inequality and, and help close the protection gap. Thank you very much. So, sorry your lunch is a little bit late for you, but just before you go for lunch, I'd like to thank our distinguished speakers today. I'd like to thank Sonia and the Banque de Luxembourg for hosting, hosting the event. The Ministry of Luxembourg, in fine, and uh, the Microinsurance Network, who is celebrating their 20 years uh, this year, I forgot to mention. And of course, uh, all of the audience. So thank you very much, and uh, we'll see you next time. Cheers. Thank you.